Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the host of AutoLine, John McElroy. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to be your MC, as it were, for the next three speakers. I'll be giving you some of uh, the things that I see going on in this industry right now and beyond the industry, too. Then I'll be doing an intro for each of the next three speakers with a recap of what they had to say. So let me get to uh, my remarks. Uh, I'm not going to show you any slides today. I, I don't have any video. I don't have any pictures. I'm just going to talk. So please put up with me for the next eight minutes. As you all know, I cover the automotive industry, which is going through an amazing transformation right now. Automakers, suppliers, they're making major changes to be competitive in the 21st century. And we've seen just now how MEDC, Cadia, the Office for the Future of Mobility and Electric or Electrification, and the Automotive Caucus are doing their part. But I'm worried that the state of Michigan is not doing its part, and that's going to hurt our automotive industry. Let's start with education. When I was in high school, the United States had the best education system in the world. Today, it's at the bottom of the list for developed countries. Back then, Michigan was a top 10 state for education. Today, according to U.S. News and World Report, we're number 42 for higher education and number 38 for K through 12. I knew it was bad. I didn't realize it was that bad. The Detroit Regional Chamber has highlighted all of this, and I'll come back to them in a moment. You'll all remember when Amazon crossed us off the list for a new headquarters, mainly because Michigan cannot provide enough skilled and educated employees. Automakers and suppliers still do a lot of engineering and R&D in Michigan, but increasingly, they're doing more in China, in Israel, in Canada, and Silicon Valley. I'll come back to education in a minute. Let's talk about Michigan's infrastructure. So much of it is just old and worn out, but all we do is just spend enough to keep it from collapsing, then we check the box and kick the can down the road. The Flint water crisis, the collapsing dams and floods, the leaded water pipes. What's next? Here's how our roads got so bad, at least as I lived it. Back in the 1950s and 60s, Michigan was considered to have the nation's best civil engineering team in the Department of Transportation. We hired the best and we paid them the best. When I was in high school, our roads and bridges were very well built and well-maintained. Then in the late 1960s, studded snow tires became legal in the state. It really made it easier to drive on snowy and icy roads. The studs were made of steel, and there were dozens and dozens of them around each tire. Cars back then were all rear-wheel drive, so you'd put a couple of studded tires on the rear. And what we liked as teenagers was stomping on the gas and spinning the tires on dry pavement because they'd shoot sparks out the back. But those tires just chewed up the pavement. And it wasn't just from teenagers doing sparky burnouts. Everybody had studded tires. And in just a couple, just a handful of winters, they put 20 years worth of wear and tear on our roads. So the state banned them, but the damage was already done. Then the 1973 oil crisis hit and the state economy took a nosedive. One way the legislature cut costs was by slashing the maintenance budget for roads. Then the second oil crisis hit. That budget was never restored. Meanwhile, our neighboring states, Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, have been spending $1 billion a year more on road maintenance than Michigan. Here we are, half a century later, we're literally $50 billion behind those states in road repair and maintenance. And yet, we don't have any plans to ever catch up, ever. You know, as a boy, I grew up in a couple of third world countries. I know firsthand what it's like when a country achieves a certain level of success, but then starts to let its infrastructure fall apart. And when everything looks run down, it just saps the energy out of its citizens. And when your citizens are not given a good education, you fall further behind. Michigan has some really good schools but we also have a very high statewide level of dropouts, of absenteeism, and of kids who are not at their grade level for reading, math, and science. This is a black problem. It's a white problem. It's a Latino problem. 
It's a native problem. It's urban. It's suburban. It's rural. So let's talk solutions. Three things. Tutors, counselors, mentors. In high school, I always struggled with math and had to go to summer school. I hated summer school. So in my junior year, my parents got me a tutor who was a senior at my high school and a wizard at math. In just a matter of weeks, she took me from a D and even an F student to someone who regularly got Bs and even some As. So there's solution one. Tutors can make a big difference. Years ago, when my kids were in school, I did volunteer work with the Livonia Public Schools. The administration then did something brilliant. It tracked down and contacted students who had graduated from its high school five years back and 10 years back. And it asked them, you were our customer, how'd we do? And they asked them, what should we have done differently? To a person, these graduates wished that they had been given better counseling. They wished they had a counselor who had told them, here's your strengths and here's your weaknesses. Here's what you need to do to bone up on, on your weaknesses. And here are the career opportunities that will open up if you do. And they wanted this counseling on a regular basis. When I was in high school, we'd see the school counselor maybe once a year. It was always a short cursory meeting and I didn't learn much from it. I'll bet you went through something similar because here's the problem. High school counselors spend 95% of their time with the 5% of students who cause problems. So their solution too, more counselors could make a big difference. And you know, we already do this with sports. Kids go to practice, they train, they get advice and tips from their coaches. We need to do the same thing for academics, but it goes beyond academics. I did relatively well in the corporate world. And one reason was because I had a mentor. He was an older executive who I really got along with and he helped me out. And having someone who was older, more experienced and wiser than I was really helped out in the corporate world. So there's solution three, life mentors. We could dramatically improve the academic performance of Michigan students with tutors, counselors, and life mentors who work with them on a regular basis. I believe we could get results fast, literally within one academic year. The Detroit Regional Chamber with the Detroit Promise and Detroit Promise Path are doing the right thing with Detroit students who wanna to go to college. Their program includes things like coaches, and it could be a blueprint of how we move forward with K through 12 students. So where do we get the money to do all this? Clearly, the federal government has a role to play. This should be part of the national debate. You know, I'm intrigued with modern monetary theory and the idea that we shouldn't worry about federal spending as long as it invests in things that make the economy grow and prosper. We shouldn't worry about federal spending that helps American citizens compete in the global economy. And maybe if we think out of the box, there's other ways to raise money. You know, wealthy Americans have all kinds of financial instruments to reduce their tax load. There's real estate investment trusts, there's rental properties, there's offshore bank accounts, and so on and so forth. Why not create a tax code that makes it so lucrative to invest your money in education that the wealthy forget all about those silly old offshore bank accounts. One thing's for sure, what we're doing now is not working. Educationally, we're near the bottom and falling behind. Every year, we condemn yet another generation to a lower standard of living. Every year, our infrastructure grows a little bit older, and yet we've got no plan to get back on track. No sense of urgency. I'm deliberately throwing this out here to light a fire. It's time to raise the bar, time to hold ourselves to a higher standard. We need to make this a part of the ongoing national debate and Michigan needs to do it if it wants to keep the automotive industry. And I wanna thank Mish Otto for giving me the opportunity to present this.